Hi, I'm Kareem Webb, CEO and founder of Fourth Movement. So glad to be here today on the Bible of Cannabis Podcast, Professionally Cannabis. Check us out. Where do they go? The smoke rings I blow each night. Oh, it gives me great see? pleasure to welcome to the pod today, Kareem Webb entrepreneurial activist and CEO of Fourth Movement, an LA-based organization spearheading projects for underserved communities to own and operate competitive retail businesses. Social equity initiatives are increasingly being worked into cannabis legalization legislation in some states in the US, but do they go far enough? I can't wait to hear your thoughts today, Kareem. So without further ado, Kareem, Welcome to the Professionally Cannabis Podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm, I really appreciate the work that you all do. Uh, it's a podcast that I listen to, and I'm excited to um, share our point of view and some of our journey and hope that uh, your listeners, or I should say my fellow listeners, um, you know, take some value out, uh, out of our conversation today. Well, well, that's absolutely brilliant to hear, and we are delighted to have you on. And Kareem, as a listener of the pod, you will know that our first and customary question for all of our guests is, what led you to the plant? Uh, you know, I think initially what led me to the plant is probably uh, peer pressure and curiosity, you know, in undergrad. <laughs> My first experience with the plant was in college. Uh, but, you know, in this iteration, as the CEO of Fourth Movement and, and in this business, what we're up to. Um, it was really, you know, the opportunity around social equity to create a business and a platform to, you know, help people leverage the opportunity um, to make it the most that it could be, that we could actually have the most impact, um, be the most effective with, with what I think is the purpose or should be the purpose for social equity generally. Like, that is my passion and I feel like it is, um, you know, really up to this point, my life's calling. And Kareem, for folks who are listening that might not be so au fait with social equity as, as a term, how would you define this? And what do social equity projects look like in, in practice? And perhaps if you allow me one more final extension of this, how does this pertain to the cannabis industry? Certainly. So social equity, um, when you hear the term, it typically, in cannabis at least, it, it, it um, refers to policy that a jurisdiction, either a state or a city, is standing up um, in order to provide opportunities, you know, and set aside type opportunities, licensing for people who typically come from some sort of traditionally disadvantaged or under-resourced background. And, um, and oftentimes in the cannabis space, the policy um, and the set aside licenses are directed towards people who come from communities that were also disproportionately impacted by the application of criminal justice or cannabis arrests. You know, there's, there is, you know, a significant amount of, I think, pressure on policymakers in some jurisdictions to acknowledge that uh, people were penalized, you know, in a disproportionate way, black and brown people, people who come from poorer communities, et cetera, um, around possession and sale of cannabis um, versus people who, you know, might've grown up more suburban, or typically more white, you know, even people who were arrested for the same amounts of product were punished differently. And so those disparities are attempting to be uh, addressed by providing opportunities for people to own businesses. And I think the assumption is that by getting an access to this license, they'll be able to stand up businesses and, and that those businesses will generate revenue and profit that will help people improve outcomes that were depressed because of what happens when you go to jail or when you get arrested and how you are kind of locked out of society or that your outcomes are predictably worse than would otherwise be the case. And so, you know, people from communities and in aggregate communities were disproportionately harmed or disproportionately got worse health outcomes or educational attainment outcomes or wealth creation outcomes because they were over arrested around cannabis. Then the idea is, well, then let's make certain that we over index with the opportunity to be engaged on the commerce side of, of this industry. Um, now that, that we're reversing this trend of, you know, not the cannabis business, which has, you know, been in existence in, in perpetuity, uh, being unregulated to now regulating it and, and giving people an opportunity to, to be in business in a, 
regulated and legal way. And and can you give us a bit of a flavor as to Fourth Movement, the work that you guys do, and sort of what in your prior professional life and background sort of led you to setting up this awesome organization? Certainly. So what we do at Fourth Movement is, you know, we go out and vet, um, find, vet, and train people who are qualified for set-aside licenses and then help them apply for the opportunity so that they apply in a way that is best in class and as competitive as possible in the application process, which increases the likelihood of, of, of being successful in the application process. Um, and then also stands up a singularly branded retail platform by which these people we train become the owner operator. So they own the majority of the businesses. They've been trained, vetted and trained to operate the business as the owner. Uh, and then we support them with best in class, uh, what we call shared services. So um, we do the HR, we do the accounting, we facilitate the supply chain, we um, facilitate the technology stack, run the website, do all of the things that you really have to onboard capital in order to attract best in class talent and have best in class solutions in order to deliver a best in class experience, both online and in retail. Um, and then leverage that scale to increase profitability on behalf of our social equity partners. That's 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 ultimately what Fourth what Fourth Movement does. Uh, and we own IP, which is you know the retail platform that's called Sixty Four and Hope. So in LA, we have twenty one uh, successful social equity partners who are all licensed, or you know their licenses are you know ha, you know have been reserved, so to speak, and 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 so they're in different stages of the entitlement process. But the first of these 21 um, licensees will be open, um, actually be soft open August 30th. And we believe like over the next two to two and a half years, we'll get the entire footprint of 21 units open in Los Angeles. And then we went through a similar process in Illinois. We were successful with one of our social equity partners. So um, we think over the course of the next year, we'll get that unit up in Illinois. And then, you know, there are other places in the country where we intend to, to, to compete and employ our model. And Kareem, across the U.S., we've, we've really seen some amazing social equity projects in places like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Oakland, as a cannabis industry in these areas has, has developed. F for you, what would you say are the, the hallmarks of a successful and robust equity initiative? And, and are there specific parts of the cannabis value chain that you think are perhaps better suited than others to giving folks opportunities to work in the industries. Now, I know your your core focus is on the the, the, the retail space. Yeah, so I'll I will um, answer the second question first. What is most lucrative, you know, and 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 the place where I think is the best element of the industry to focus varies by region. So, in other words, in in California, where from a biomass perspective, supply chain perspective, product is ubiquitous. I think retail is kind of king, owning the shelf space makes the most sense. If you go into Illinois, New York, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, et cetera, where you've got, for instance, in Illinois, you've got 300,000 tons of demand, of biomass demand, consumer demand in Illinois, and you have less than 100,000 tons of biomass currently entitled, let alone you know stood up and actually functioning. And so, you know, what an, an, a quality eighth goes for in LA versus what a quality eighth goes for in, in, in Illinois is two and a half times. And so I, I think at least in the short and medium term, I'm talking about over the course of the next 10 years or so, I think that um, the biomass side, so the cultivation side and maybe even the distribution side of the business is probably more lucrative in um, the limited supply states versus a state like California or Washington or Oregon or Colorado, where I think, you know, retail probably has more leverage. Um, what we've seen in the industry around social equity and what makes for good social equity policy, I think it's one, people actually having the opportunity. So, you know, what we've seen in Los Angeles is significant delays, delays that have been financially harmful to um, social equity program participants. But ultimately, of the 400 retail licenses within the city of Los Angeles, you know, you're going to have more than half of them be social equity licensees. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. And I think mm -hmm. that there's there's the chance to have success. 
I, you know, I think I don't think in anywhere we've really seen success, you know, at any scale yet. And I and, and I think the measurement of success is that you got to have more success stories than than not based upon the total opportunity that's been given in any jurisdiction and then nationally in aggregate. We haven't seen that yet. We haven't had time to see it yet either, given, uh, you know, there's been really kind of a limited number of social equity licenses issued in both San Francisco and in Oakland. Los Angeles, we're just starting the beginning of starting to see social equity licensees and retail locations starting to open. A year from now, 18 years, 18 months from now, you'll you'll see, you know, north of probably 100 units open. Then the question will be, how well capitalized are they um, and how well can they compete in the marketplace? Social equity, to be successful, people actually have to make money. And the cannabis space is a very, very competitive space. And if you're not well capitalized and if you don't have the acumen or aren't surrounded with the acumen, you know, in your enterprise and that acumen is not employed in a smart, strategic, consistent way, um, you're going to have a tough time being profitable. And you got to be profitable, and then you have to have the character to kind of do the right things with those profit with those profits, um, in order to impact the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the application of criminal justice. And then, in so doing, social equity is successful. So until we get to that piece, who you know, did these social equity limited license licensees make money in this business? And then, when they made money, did they start impacting community not only themselves and their family, which does make a difference? but the greater community that was harmed by the over-policing um, of cannabis and the over-arrests and the over-sentencing around cannabis. That's the only way we really reverse some of the harm. And social equity programs aren't successful unless we reverse some of the harm. Sort of building on that, you, you mentioned about the delays that we've seen in, in some of the areas in, in California with regards to the social equity projects. And well, of course, cannabis legalization is sweeping through the states at the moment. And there really has been a, well, I'd say a mixed bag insofar as the, the degree of which social equity has been wrapped into legalization legislation, you know, the ways in which states are dealing with folks that may have had previous nonviolent drug charges, for example, expungement of records, and ultimately the support given to communities who have been disproportionately affected by archaic drug policies. You know, New York is, is one of those states who, who recently legalized and in some circles have been applauded for, for their emphasis on social equity within their legislation. What, what do you think, Kareem, that legislators who are yet to change their drug laws can learn from states who have already legalized or, or decriminalized? What, what have some places done well and is, you know, wh wh what have they got right? And conversely, where do you think policy and the practical application of policy hasn't really gone far enough or, or not really gone anywhere at all? It, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a conundrum. You know, what we've seen happen um, in Los Angeles, I think we saw it happen similarly um, in a sense and differently in other sense in Illinois, is that, you know, um, you get people who really care about, well, uh, let's start here. First of all, social equity policy is not something that is necessarily in the interest of the first movers in the cannabis space. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the, let's call it the, the multi-state operators in our industry, you know, they're referred to as MSOs and those MSOs in most states were in limited license states for medical licenses. So in Illinois, there were however many, there were 12, 13 total businesses that were allowed to have licenses where you had to be vertically integrated, meaning you had cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and retail. You had all elements of the business within one in one business. The same thing happened in New Jersey. The same thing happened in Pennsylvania. Same thing happened in New York. Same thing happened in Florida. You know, and so, and all of those first movers were majority white, if not only white companies who mm -hmm. were able to go raise a lot of money and be first movers. So when you've raised that money and you are a first mover in the state, your goal is to, uh, you know, continue to increase shareholder value. It's not, it's not to really dilute your footprint or your opportunity moving forward is to continue to, 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 to gain more and more market share. So that is in, was in the interest of the first movers and none of the first movers really across the country were people of color and there was no social equity type emphasis or program in any of these states. So that's first, all the first movers, all the money, all the early success excluded people who were disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. And so then you have, as you went from the medical license space to 
the adult use space, you have progressive legislators uh, and policymakers in cities and states who advocated for policy that would include um, generally people of color, right? And then negotiated policy um, kind of backed by and supported by community activists who were insisting on inclusion in the process and in more progressive or let's just call it democratic states you got social equity policy mm -hmm. so if you notice there is no social equity policy in any republican led governor state right there's not there's not one in missouri there's not one in oklahoma you know uh, which are also adult use use states but there is in california there is in illinois there is in massachusetts there will be in new york it, it is a blue state red state issue and what we've seen in blue states is that that you get social equity policy that really focuses on trying to create some fairness in terms of who gets the opportunity, but the policy doesn't um, uh, go far enough to be designed to ensure that the people who get the opportunity are really successful with the opportunity and that the community benefits from the character of the individual who gets the license, i.e. we end up with lottery type programs in, in, in Illinois, which you know you don't really know the character of the person who's gonna get the license. I don't think that's in the interest of social equity. Um, and then you, know, you also you know, are not able to, to, to under, really understand the business plan or the, the ability for people to capitalize the opportunity in a way that would, lend, that would lead it to be kind of predictively successful or competitive within the space. And so I think what will end up happening is in Los Angeles, you'll get a lot of social equity licensees who will, um, those licenses will end up being distressed assets. And I think you'll find the same thing in Illinois. We just know that there's a lottery um, last week and the week before last, and, and there are articles out there where there are social equity individuals who, you know, won the lottery and they're out attempting to sell those licenses to the highest bidder, which is certainly not in the interest of community and social equity. If they just, one person has a license, they get some money one time um, to sell that license. The business never gets stood up. That person who, you know, you would assume um, would be predisposed to hire people that maybe people from the majority community wouldn't hire. All of the things that matter around local ownership, um, you know, acumen and, you know, people growing, thriving businesses doesn't end up happening. So in those ways, the policy has failed, you know, in, in, in both of those jurisdictions. From what I understand and what I hear about New York, I think they're, they're trying to get it right. They're trying to do it in some sort of meritorious process, which is what I believe in and, and, and what's in the interest of community. You know, they're trying to do it, you know, where people really get trained, where they bring in, you know, community partners and people who have, you know, skill set around workforce development, et cetera, to, you know, prepare people for running businesses and, you know, trying to select the people who are actually going to run the most competitive businesses uh, and couple them with money and, you know, kind of real estate, commercial real estate uh, companies who will, you know, kind of, you know, allow people to to lease in competitive retail locations. Those are the, the types of considerations I think programs have to really dig into in order for it ultimately to be successful in the most meaningful way, which is what I hope will happen. So I think New York has got is 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 probably has learned a lot from what's gone wrong in California, what went wrong in Illinois. And, and in areas where policy doesn't really look like it's supporting change in a meaningful and impactful enough way, what would you say, Kareem, that business leaders operating within the industry can and, and should do? What, what sort of initiatives have you seen from the business world that have ticked all the boxes for you? And, and sort of what impact can business leaders themselves have on pushing through policy change, policy change that would indeed facilitate more meaningful social equity initiatives within them? Yeah, I, I think it's important for people trying to do the right things for the right reasons to be successful in their businesses and mm -hmm. use those as, you know, business cases for doing more of that. Because I think that's what, what people will pay attention to long term. What's successful and who is being positive, positively impacted by that model and how? And when you can prove that, then you can um, kind of justify you know, the growth uh, of that model. And I think that's what's important at the, very, at, at the beginning. You know, I, and, and I think there's a lot of uh, uh, personal preference and, and, and commitment around fairness mm -hmm. that people have to search their hearts out for as leaders. So if you are a leader of a business, if you own a business, 
um, where there you you have an opportunity to develop people, you have an opportunity to diversify your supply chain, you have an opportunity to be um, intentional about who the beneficiaries are of your enterprise, then do that. You know, and I think that there is there is business growth and market growth potential, you know, in diversity. You know, I think that studies would show in and out, outside of cannabis that um, there is value in diversification. And I think there's a lot of credibility in it, too. And and who else in the space do you see or have you identified as folks that are doing really great things in the, the social equity realm? I, I know sort of the last time we, we spoke, which was at the, the GCI Summit, I, I had also had a conversation with Jason Wilde and NBA All-Star Chris Webber, who are launching their own socially conscious private equity fund. Sort of what, what, what other or who are the other folks in the space that are sort of leading the charger uh, uh, alongside you that, that you think are, are really doing great things. Yeah, I love what Chris and Jason and Lavetta and their team are doing, oh. um, you know, over there because they're raising a significant amount of money. $100 million is a lot of money to be, in, to, to, to be able to invest in these businesses that have these licenses. And, they've, you know, they've got a strategy. You know, I think it's an effective and powerful strategy as they implement it. And Jason Wilde is an executor, right? Like it, it's going to happen. And I think Chris is and his partner, Levetta, are really smart and are, are committed to doing things the right way. I don't know of anybody else at that kind of scale that's positioned to be able to leverage and move capital um, in that way. And they're doing so and they're in the social equity space in Detroit and in Michigan, um, in Illinois, in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, making a difference for entrepreneurs who really need that capital to to, to compete. So I, I think they're doing a great, great job. I think Paul Judge has an initiative in in in, in Georgia that I think is is really exciting and is getting engaged in in Virginia and with his background, you know, in technology. I think uh, the acumen that he brings to the table and, and what he's going to be doing with his group is exciting. Uh, and I'm excited uh, for what, what what they're building. You know, I actually think some of the government relations work and the long term strategy of, of Canopy and what Canopy is doing is really interesting to me. And I think they think about it in a real smart enterprise way, that there is value to be accrued to them, that there is ways to leverage their approach to social equity and equity in this industry that will move the bar from a policy perspective um, in a way that's in the interest of their enterprise and shareholders. So I think they think about it um, strategically in a way where there's win wins. On the parent company side, outside of their social equity fund, you know, you've got real, you know, kind of culture giants on that side of their business and, that, you know, their product is quality and that there are, are people of color who are sensitive to and, and, and culturally competent in terms of what really is wanted and needed to happen that are in the industry in a, you know, in an earnest, uh, determined uh, and consistent way. And I think that that matters. I think talent being in the industry um, of culturally competent people who are unapologetic about fairness and equity matters. I think what Al is doing in Viola is important. Al is, is, is you know, probably the most visible and um, up to this point, most successful uh, in terms of having product in stores and having a national footprint, African-American in space. Uh, his recent alignment with Alan Iver Iverson, some of the, the talent that he's brought on board, that is, you know, um, African American and, and and Latino Chicano talent um, really matters, and 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 his success really matters. And then I think that there are um, some social equity players that are are more regional at this time, but are best in class in their execution. Chris Ball, Ball Family Farms, out here in L.A. You know, I think it, you know they're just examples of how you can prove that cultural competency matched with tenacity and grit. Um, and industry, you know, knowledge and acumen can lead to, you know, industry, being an industry leader. And, you know, all of those examples are, are examples of folks that I think are industry leaders and are poised to, to take off in this business. And I think all of which are also looking for people to bring along with them. Well, Kareem, I am devastated that we have run out of time here today, but I am so looking forward to welcoming you back to the pod in a future season when a lot of these stores are up and running and seeing how things are going at that point. But for the time being, as I mentioned, unfortunately, the clock has beaten us. So I'd like to say once again, Kareem, thank you for joining us on the Professionally Cannabis podcast and, and keep up the good work. We, we absolutely love what you're doing. And we love what you're doing, Jonathan. Thank you so much for the platform and caring enough to have us back. And I promise the next time I'll come back, it'll be with Asia and or one or two of our social equity partners. We'll be sitting around the table and you'll be hearing from their, their perspective and point of view as well. 
please take me above. Take me with you. 